Public audit. As always, I would ask all members and witnesses at the outset to keep questions and answers concise and to the point. And if uh, everyone could uh, just ensure that their electronic devices are in silent mode. Uh, I think the first thing is, uh, I think there's apologies from Jenny Mara for today. Um, if we go to agenda item one, it's decision on taking business in private. Uh, do members agree to take agenda item three in private? Right. Agenda item two is evidence on Audit Scotland's annual report and accounts for the year to 31st March 2018. And members have a copy of the annual report and accounts in their meeting papers. I'd like to welcome to the meeting Ian Leach, Chair of the Board of Audit Scotland. Ian's accompanied by Caroline Gardner, Auditor General for Scotland, Diane McGiffin, Chief Operating Officer, and Stuart Dennis, Corporate Finance Manager of Scotland. I'd like to invite Ian Leach and then the Auditor General to make uh, short introductory statements, uh, no more than a couple of minutes. Uh, please. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Members. As you know, our role as a board is to oversee the exercise of all the functions of Audit Scotland. Audit Scotland supports the Accounts Commission and the Auditor General in their roles of providing independent assurance to the people of Scotland that public money is spent properly and provides value for money. That means, of course, that Audit Scotland has also got to demonstrate the same things in managing its finances prudently. As you'll see from this year's annual report, we managed to deliver £2.4 million in efficiencies, cost reductions and additional income against a target of £1.8 million. This was 9.6% of our total expenditure budget. Most savings came from revised external firms' audit contracts, staffing costs, following organisational changes and reduced consultancy expenditure and training costs. In 1718, Audit Scotland spent £25.6 million on services for the Auditor General and the Accounts Commission. Of these costs, £18 million was recovered through charges to audited bodies and from other income. The balance of £7.6 million, net operating expenditure and the net finance costs of £0.9 million, was met from direct funding provided by the Scottish Parliament on the recommendation of this Commission. And this sum, £8.5 million, was £0.6 million less than the estimate, that is the budget for the year. The board has met eight times during the year and its committees, the Audit Committee and the Ruination and Human Resources Committee, met nine times in all. I'm very grateful for the support of fellow board members. During this year, we welcomed Dr Graham Sharp as the new Chair of the Accounts Commission, appointed by Ministers. And I would like to thank Ronnie Hines, who is the Vice Chair of the Accounts Commission, for carrying out this role on an acting basis. Thank you, Convener. I believe the Auditor General would like to make a few opening remarks. Thank you, Chair. This is a time of significant change for public bodies with new challenges and new demands on public audit. We're responding by investing in our people and strengthening our audit quality regime. The focus on audit quality reflects both the risks associated with increasing pressures on audited bodies and the cost reductions that we achieved through the most recent round of audit appointments. We set up two new teams, the Appointments and Assurance Team and the Professional Support Team. One of the first tasks of the new Appointments and Assurance Team was to develop a new audit quality framework which combines the highest professional and ethical standards with strengthened arrangements for internal quality reviews, external quality reviews commissioned from the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Scotland, and enhanced reporting audit on, on audit quality to me, the Accounts Commission, the Audit Scotland Audit Committee and, our, and the public. We believe this is now the most rigorous approach of any public audit agency in the UK. The new professional support team works closely with the appointments and assurance team to provide guidance, <coughs> advice and support to auditors. We're represented on and engaged with a wide range of UK and international professional bodies and audit agencies, allowing us to influence professional standards and share good practice. Finally, Chair, we've maintained our focus on the implementation and impact of Scotland's new financial powers. This is a critical area where Scotland's overall budget will be far more closely tied to the performance of the Scottish economy in future, with much more volatility and uncertainty than in the past, and therefore a greater need to ensure financial sustainability. As always, we'll do our best to answer the Commission's questions. Thank you for that. Um, we'll open it up to questioning, and perhaps I can uh, ask the first question. 
staff costs are at 67% of the of the budget. So obviously anything that affects staff terms and conditions can have a fairly profound effect on the budget. And on page 10 of the annual report, Audit Scotland states that it's implemented a new strategic approach to managing and developing people. And it's a recurring theme through the report. And specifically on page 56, Audit Scotland reports that it's developed a new, simpler and more flexible approach to pay, reward, career progression and how we resource the audit work. Can you give some background and explanations as to this new strategic approach and identify the anticipated outcomes and improvements that's envisaged? I'll kick off the moment and then I'll stand to pick up how we're doing that. Um, this is a really important issue for us, Chair. As the Commission knows, um, we can only carry out our work by having the appropriately skilled and qualified staff to do that, um, and we work within the constraints, quite rightly, of the Scottish Government's pay policy, which means that we um, have to work hard to make sure we can recruit and retain staff who are also in demand by the professional accountancy <laughs> firms and public bodies more widely. Um, that means we have to think about the way we... Um, our overall reward package, the way we develop people and the way we shape jobs to make them attractive to people now and for the longer term. Diane's been leading this work and I'll ask her to talk you through how we do it. Thank you. Um, we have been working with colleagues in Audit Scotland for about three years to build and redesign how we organise work and how we um, create career progression, how we handle uh, promotion development and therefore the uh, way in which we can recruit in the external market but also internally when we uh, come to do that. We've organised our job roles into three job families and there's um, proposals for um, colleagues to progress within those job families and to um, use a process that we're calling career development gates in order to make a case that they're able to take on additional work or for the business to decide we have opportunities and we'd like to invite people forward to gain uh, new experiences and to broaden their, um, their opportunities. For the first time, we have a single um, structure of job families for the whole organisation, including people who work on financial audit, best value audits, performance audits, and our corporate um, support services team. So everyone can see clearly how they work together in the different, um, different parts of the business. Key for us was um, taking quite a hard look at how the previous systems we were using were working or not for us. And we found that internal um, recruitment and external recruitment and promotion opportunities were causing quite a lot of dissatisfaction for colleagues because um, there, there was a time-consuming process. Um, it felt that the feedback process could be improved for candidates. And now we've turned that around and we're using internal recruitment and um, professional development, um, our um, annual um, recording process of conversations to promote professional and technical development, which we call 3D. We're using all of that to enable everyone in the organisation to build a portfolio of their experience and to be able to make, uh, make a case for moving to do different things and to expanding their skills and experience. Underpinning all of that is our investment in professional training and um, professional development. So our graduate trainee scheme fits into this um, model, but also has um, the goal of delivering professionally qualified auditors um, at the end of it. And we're also um, looking to enhance the sense of everyone working for one organisation um, rather than on individual projects or outputs for the business and that's been going really well for us. What it's enabling us to do in the job market is to offer something um, attractive and simple and give people a clearer idea of career progression because all of these changes have been linked to a much simpler pay model which um, has simple incremental steps um, and um, so on. What we're doing as a business is trying to make sure that we are offering flexible um, employment opportunities, um, a rich um, development and career training environment and the great experience that comes from working for an organisation that has um, the ability to look across the whole of the public sector 
um, and to um, produce reports and outputs that can help make a difference to public services. And that approach in the external recruitment market is um, being very successful for us in attracting applicants to come and work with us. And as you'll know from our um, need to expand to meet the responsibilities of new financial powers, attracting some new people has got to be um, one of the things that we do well this year. It sounds good. Uh, if I had a look at your retention levels and it doesn't seem to have had a huge impact on that yet. Um, the retention levels this year are a combination of a number of things. Uh, we have um, in there uh, some fixed term contracts which were coming to an end, uh, some retirements, some student placements that were coming to an end. And I think the underlying resignations, I'll have to take my specs off to see this, um, underlying resignations were um, 18 resignations, um, which is about 6% of the, the turnover. We examine all departures um, with the within the organisation to understand uh, what's happening there. We do need some turnover to um, help with the organ help with organisational rejuvenation. Um, we discuss departures with individuals and with managers to make sure that we are picking up on any signals that things aren't going well. And the um, turnover rate, um, as published in the annual report, is similar to last year. The underlying um, picture includes a number of people whose departure from the organisation would be known or planned. Clearly going forward, and at the moment also, I would guess, IT skills are quite important and they're difficult to secure right across the public sector. Yeah. How are you handling that? So we've got, um, you're absolutely right, I would say, um, for, for everybody and for ourselves. We've been building a strong team. We've been focusing on um, investing and developing in the people who work with us, in diversifying the number of posts we have in IT. Um, we've introduced some new systems in IT to um, bring greater resilience to the team. So we have um, always a senior manager on call um, 24 seven and that rotates across a pool of three people. We have been um, bringing in some external expertise. We've been looking at um, the, the benchmarking of pay in IT services and we've had a discussion with uh, the remuneration committee about the potential, if necessary at times, to be able to um, recruit in a slightly different market um, for the, the skills that we need. So far, we've been able to develop our own people. We've been able to source um, specific skills for short-term uh, needs when we have them. And we've also been um, using a variety of um, external benchmarking, a strategic plan around digital, uh, our digital strategy, which is... Um, consistently focused on improving the security of our own digital services and we've been building the skills of the team behind that. But we're very aware that um, should we need to recruit in the external market that would be quite that would be quite difficult. Just a of Is there a specific audit qualification in IT? You know, the, it, it is a very specialised skill being able to carry out an IT audit. Uh, I think I, I a, a short answer would be yes, there are a variety of things, but I would need to um, I'd need to um, get better uh, be better equipped people than I to give you the detail of what they are, and some of those uh, some of those skills are in our organisation. Beyond that, um, it's increasingly the case that all of our auditors need to be skilled in digital. In the past, we had a small number of computer auditors who would go and look at the computer systems and the controls around them. We still have those people. But our digital strategy is recognising that more and more public services are provided digitally and that auditors need to be able to understand what that means for the risks that they're auditing um, and uh, when they need to bring in specialist expertise. So our digital strategy is very much about what we audit, how we audit it, and the skills we need to do it. Again, that will be a long-term investment program but we don't think it's going to change uh, that we need to keep developing those skills for the future. Rona. Thank you convener. Good morning. Um, yeah, I'd like to ask you about um, areas uh, that have been identified for improvement and risks in an audit and the process for you to follow those up promptly. Can you explain how um, how you do that, how, how quickly you, you would follow these up 
and also why it's been identified as a priority for 2018-19. Um, can you refer me to the page you're looking at, Ms Mackay, so we can um, focus on I don't the have the page in front of me at the minute. Okay. I need to um, well, check through the... Uh, th that operates in two ways. One, all of the audit work that we do um, is based on um, a proper understanding of the risks in that specific um, audited body. Um, there are some risks that the auditor has to um, assume in planning their audit work, and the key one of those is the risk of material misstatements in the financial, st in the financial statements themselves. Um, but beyond that, everybody will have different risks. So the new Social Security Agency, um, there are very specific risks that we need to be thinking about there. Um, because of the uh, scale of payments involved, the number of people affected and their importance to people's lives. Um, the risks associated with something like the Cap Futures IT system are quite different um, and closer to the sort of area that Mr Beatty was just asking about. Um, so in that context, it's the starting point of the auditor's work every year is to, to make sure they understand the organisation that they're auditing, um, what the risks are likely to be and what that means for the audit work that they carry out. Within Audit Scotland, um, we, um, our auditors, both the internal auditors and the external auditors, go through a similar process. Um, it's informed to an extent by our own approach to risk management as a board, um, which is making sure that we understand it, but it's obviously also designed to test that and to make sure there, there aren't things that we've missed and that our response to risks is the right one. That will then feed very directly into the internal audit programme that's agreed by our audit committee with our internal auditors and the results are reported back. Um, and we've got quite a rigorous um, and transparent system where the internal auditors' recommendations are reported back to the board, uh, to the audit committee, um, on a regular cycle, um, together with updates from the management team on what progress we've made and what's still outstanding and the internal auditors do an annual report um, that provides assurance to the audit committee and the board um, that that's working well, that there aren't um, recommendations that have been lost as a result of that. Um, so there's a, there's a parallel between the two, but it, it operates um, very rigorously within Audit Scotland itself. And, and the fact that it's been identified as a priority for improvement, does that suggest there was a weakness there before? No, I think that's referring to the, the audit work we do on audited bodies. Um, and I think what it's recognising is that um, there are increasing pressures on, on audited bodies as um, the financial pressures continue to affect them and demand continues to rise. We're seeing new um, areas of pressure like the new financial powers and potentially um, the UK's withdrawal from the European Union. And therefore, that need to make sure we're really focusing on the most important risks, I think, is, is rising in priority each year. I'm not sure if Diane wants to add to that. Um, just to say on the um, on the audit work we do, this is also about um, how we um, how we discuss priorities within teams and how we prioritise resources and, and enabling us to do that maybe a little bit more quickly than we might have done in the past, which requires us internally to have good information about how we're deploying everyone and so on. So it's a continuous improvement process which is ongoing. Um, how can we get better at this? I think we're always asking ourselves, how can we get better at doing this? And this year we're saying we, we really think there's something in this for us to focus on. Okay, thank you. Alison Johnson. Thank you, convener. Um, good morning. On page 19 of the annual report, Audit Scotland states that a priority for 2018-19 is to streamline our, your audit work. Um, however, on page 36 of the annual report, it further states that fee income from audited budgets exceeded budget by 0.7 million due to additional work undertaken uh, by in-house teams and by external audit firms. Um, so can I ask how... You know, can you explain how audit work might be streamlined in 2018-19, given the experience of 17-18, uh, when additional work was undertaken by in-house and external um, audit firms? I'll kick off, if I may, on the um, reference to streamlining on page 19, and then ask Diane and Stuart to pick up from there. Um, in, in a sense, I think this follows on very directly from the question Ms Mackay was just asking, um, that the expectations on us, the range of things that we're required to do, um, is expanding with new financial powers, increasing pressures and um, e EU withdrawal all in the mix. Um, and we are very conscious that we need to make sure we are prioritising what audit work we do in individual audited bodies. 
one of the benefits of the public audit system in Scotland is that we are able to benchmark the approaches that the Audit Scotland teams take with those taken by the, the various firms who carry out audit work on behalf of me and the Accounts Commission. Um, there are some differences in the audit methodologies and the audit, pro the audit approaches that are taken, um, and we know that there is some scope for making sure that people are, are carrying out that risk assessment and planning process, and then making sure that really drives through the audit work that they do, that they're clear why they're carrying out each piece of audit work, and they're not carrying out audit work that's not related to the, the risks and priorities in that body. Now, there's a balance to be struck. We clearly need to make sure that we've got the sort of wider um, view of the body and, and our antennae open for other problems to be following up, but we think in some areas there's scope to streamline the audit approach and more particularly its application in individual bodies. Beyond that, um, we, we do um, carry out the work that's required in an individual body where particular risks arise, um, and I'll ask Diane and perhaps Stuart to pick that up. Um, that's helpful. So in our um, model, there is always the scope for um, appointed auditors and audited bodies to agree additional fees for additional audit work which is not necessarily the same thing as saying that audit wasn't streamlined because it may be that in a particular year an audited body is um, dealing with something that it would like additional um, audit coverage of and they will agree an additional fee for that. So we're trying to do both things at the same time, keep our core audit um, providing that risk-based coverage but also be streamlined in terms of what it's costing and how we're delivering it but also giving auditors the ability to agree additional fees if necessary for additional work which is beyond the scope of uh, what we're planning to do and I think in um, I'll hand over to Stuart in a second because I think in the in the last year we can tell you more about the additional fees that were generated it's something we monitor very closely so um, we know what additional fees are being agreed between auditors and audited bodies and we follow that um, closely to make sure that we we form a view that that's also appropriate but there is scope for the auditor on the ground to agree something uh, locally I don't know Stuart if there's anything to say as, you know, as a commission, I think we're seeking assurances that Audit Scotland has sufficient resources, um, reasonable plans and realistic budgets in place to complete the planned audits. We can absolutely give you that assurance. Um, the other thing um, to add to what Diane has said is that, um, as well as the ability to agree additional fees, if we think that additional audit work is required, then we can um, effectively impose an additional fee. Um, so one of the reasons for income being above budget last year was that additional fees were required for the work carried out at the Scottish Police Authority, for example, where a range of problems emerged during the audit planning process um, and in the audit of the um, European Agricultural Funds audit, um, where the problems that um, arose from the uh, limits of the CAP Futures IT system to do what was required meant that additional audit work was required to fulfil the EU's requirements. So we have that safeguard that we can um, impose an additional fee where that's required, but you have my assurance that we've got the resources we need to fulfil our responsibilities with the support of this Commission and the additional resources you've approved for us over the last couple of years. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I, I can add a small amount to that. Um, it's like the Auditor General says, is that a lot of the income was around the European Agricultural Fund, um, the additional complexities around that. Um, so we have a core um, indicative fee of, of what we're expected to audit, and then what happens is, is um, you get um, complex issues in certain... For example, there was one in, in Aberdeen Council which had a corporate bond, which was quite a unique... Area, so we they we agreed or they agreed the audit firm an additional fee for that. So there are specific areas right across the board where an additional fee will be charged for extra work. On that issue of, of local government, on page thirty six of the annual report, Audit Scotland states that 0.4 million of additional fee income was raised due to, uh, as you've been speaking about, complexities and additional work within the local government sector. In its budget proposal for 1819, uh, considered by this Commission, in January, Audit Scotland um, provided for a minimal increase of 18,000 in the fee income it estimates as being receivable from the local government sector. Um, now, I, I just want to, to confirm that you're satisfied that the complexities in matters requiring additional work and fees in 2017-18 have been resolved and the budget proposal for 1819 remains realistic particularly in relation to the local government sector. 
Um, it, it, it certainly does overall. As the Commission knows, um, we've refined the approach we um, take to um, recovering our income through fees. Three quarters of it comes through, through fees to audited bodies, about a quarter through the funds that are approved by this Commission. Um, and with the Board's support and encouragement, we've moved to a position where each year now we plan the budget on a sector base basis and then reconcile that at the end of the year. Within local government um, and the other sectors that pay for their audit, there is always the ability for additional fees to be raised where the work merits that. And that's one of the mechanisms we use for balancing income and expenditure by sector. Um, so the complexities tend to arise at the level of an individual body rather than the sector as a whole, and that body will pay for the work that's required as a result of that. But we do now monitor and report uh, the sector balance in that way. It's something the board's been very keen to encourage, and I know this committee's shown an interest in as well. Yes. I mean, you, you have obviously repeatedly advised us that um, audited bodies require certainty um, in respect of, of the cost of, of the audit. Um, and the additional work carried out in 1718 does appear to have been unplanned and, and unbudgeted. Um, so I think as a commission, we'd like to seek some assurance that the that the additional costs in 1718 are not, re, you know, they're not going to keep recurring. Um, may I answer? It would be... Um, it would be helpful for us perhaps to um, set out for you the um, what's covered in the um, in the audit that we set the budget around and then the um, the the opportunities and the need that we have um, as we deliver the audit to um, adjust fees as necessary we try to keep that to a minimum but I'm afraid it will always be necessary in some cases because we have to recover the costs for additional work that's required in the year, as, um, as um, Stuart has outlined, um, we had particular issues with the EFA audit. We're um, taking stock on the planning for those audits for next year, so we'll take stock as to whether there were any systemic issues in there or whether there were um, one-off issues. We also take stock every year on um, but prior to the start of the audit year, which starts in November, we take stock with the Accounts Commission um, for local government and with the Auditor General for Health and Central Government on the fee levels that we're proposing for those audits. And we will use the intelligence that we've got from um, the the year in practice um, to see what we're recommending there. So there will always be some departure from the budget that we set. I think that's unavoidable and it wouldn't be uh, it wouldn't be right for me to um, assure you otherwise. But what we could perhaps do is give you a, a, a give you after the meeting a greater breakdown of exactly what that was. And please be assured we'll be examining all of that as we set fees for the, the autumn and go forward. There's a very dynamic process of preparing the budget that comes to yourself, preparing the audit fees budget, discussing with all with um, stakeholders and, and so on. So that's an iterative process that goes on all the time. We want to deliver certainty, but in, on some individual audits that is not possible. Um, because the events will have happened that we have to respond to. Any uh, are there ever occasions where you know unexpected increases in costs are, you know, a real issue for local governments, for example? The point that I'd like to add to what Diane's um, outlined for you is that the, um, the audit fees for the body are set on the assumption that they have in place good systems of internal control, that they're able to prepare their financial statements within the agreed time scale, that those, those audited statements, those financial statements don't um, undergo significant change between the time they're provided to the auditor and the end of the audit. Now, in most cases, that assumption is sound and we're able to deliver the audit for the fee that's um, set out in the plan. Um, but for example, in the case of the SPA over the last three or four years, we've seen um, real problems with some elements of the financial statements, um, a lot of additional work required to get them to the point where they can be audited and to answer the queries of the auditors. And those are the sorts of circumstances where additional work is carried out and therefore an additional fee is required to recover the costs. If the audited bodies have in place robust systems, um, strong approaches to producing their financial statement, then we deliver the audit for the amount of the fee that was originally planned. So a lot of that variation is in their control. It's a small number of audits and it's a small proportion of our overall costs. Um, but we um, have made that more transparent and we're happy to give you a breakdown of the figures if that would be useful to the Commission. Thank you very much. Thank you. That breakdown would be very useful. Sure.
Yeah. Bill? Thank you, Convener. Can I just mention for the record that um, I'm a member of the Institute of Chartered Accountants in Scotland and used to be a KPMG partner. Okay. Um, if I can turn to professional training, um, if I may, which of course is a significant investment, not just in money, but also in, in, in time and time when um, staff are not available to, to do their um, professional work. Um, on page 10, you state that Audit Scotland has worked with graduate trainees to improve the trainee scheme. However, then further on in page 23, you say there's been a decrease in the number of trainees achieving exam success from a peak of 92.7% in 15-16 to 88% in 17-18. And also further on in page 36, you um, um, say that the training and recruitment costs were point one million lower than budget. So can you advise what actions have been taken to identify the reasons for the decrease in exam performance by trainees recently and how this will be addressed? And secondly, why were training costs underspent and can that be linked to the reduction in, in exam success? Um, our trainee scheme is a very important part of our workforce planning overall. Um, it's, it's a part of the overall approach that Diane was outlining earlier in the meeting. Um, I think it's worth um, being clear to start with that our uh, success rate is still very high for professional examinations. Um, ICAS have got no concerns. We discuss it with them regularly. Um, and with the numbers of uh, students we have going through, quite a small uh, number of students can have a, a significant looking impact on the pass rate. But I'll ask Diane to talk you through the approach we're taking to the trainee scheme um, and the action we're taking around that. I'm very happy to do so. So we began training with ICAS um, in the ICAS scheme in 2010 and 38 trainees have qualified across the 2010 to 2014 intake and it, it probably takes about four years to qualify. So our total intake with uh, SIPFA since we began is 92 trainees just to give you a sense of this, the, the scale of this. Um, the 2016 intake of eight trainees began their exams in, um, got their exam results in January 2018 and 100% of that cohort passed at the first attempt. But as um, in any year, we have people at, at different stages of the training. Um, the 2015 intake of 11 trainees sat various examinations uh, last year and there were four um, examination failures and those are single failures of a part of the exam all going on to resets. So um, those are um, being resat. Two of them are, have already passed, I think, and two are resitting in uh, the current year, 2018-19. We monitor the exam results very closely. We support the students very closely. And we discuss the results with ICAS and with managers closely. ICAS think we have a good training scheme. And we um, have, um, as um, the Auditor General has said, very strong results. So what you're seeing is a snapshot each year of people at very different stages. But please be assured that we um, we look very closely at this. Um, we celebrate with the um, with our colleagues um, all the passes, and we provide support to help them uh, get through to the next stage. If unfortunately they've been unsuccessful, um, the overall percentages each year vary because um, if they're relatively small numbers, um, that can adjust the uh, the figure overall. Um, typically about 30 to 40 exams are sat in a year period, depending on the numbers and the stages that people are at. Um, and um, we are, um, as, you, as we've said in the annual report over the past year, we've been working with the cohort of trainees who are a, a key um, part of our workforce to understand how they would like the scheme and the support that we provide to work for them. So we've had some brilliant um, initiatives this year that have gone very well where one cohort of trainees have um, been developing their um, training skills and they have delivered training to the next cohort of trainees about what it's like as a trainee to do final year accounts for example and that's been really successful both for the people delivering the training who've got experience of something that will help them stand them in good stead when they're in front of audit committees um, and so on but also for the trainees facing that part of their experience for the first time 
hearing and being coached directly from their peers about how to go about it and what to do. So we're continually enriching the scheme. It's very important and we, um, ex you know, we look at the exam results very closely. These exam results, we understand every single person's uh, process, every single person's experience here, and we have plans in place for every single person here. And it's not a concern in its own right, um, the position at the end of the year. Um, I know that's a very detailed answer. I know it's very important to you. It's very important to us. And I just want to give you um, an insight into the level at which we, s we manage the graduate trainee scheme. Any here to enrich their experience, if that's <laughs> what it's like. Um, we frequently <laughs> bring them to Papples. <laughs> <laughs> do you? Um, how do you reward exam success? We have. Uh, um, we have first. Uh, we have in our scheme a uh, cash payment for first time exam passes, and as part of our recent um, pay and reward negotiations, we increased that. I'm slightly um, sad to say, for the first time in 14 years, I think. Um, and that's to uh, to recognise first time passes. And I know that it's um, it's it's a small token. Um, it's valued by um, by trainees. What are the consequences of not passing? Support to try again, and discussions about how the course is going, how the work's going, and if there was repeated um, failure to progress, we'd be having a conversation about whether this was the right career choice for someone. And do you have people in that circumstance? Occasionally. So that's generally you'll get people through? Uh, generally, yeah. Ge generally, I think, um, I need to go back and check the data. My sense is that generally, um, if it's not working for someone, we're picking that up within the first year or so. Okay, thank you. Rona? Thank you. On page 22 of your report, you say you carried out an efficiency review of performance management and how you, you use your time. Um, can you tell us, please, what the outcome of the efficiency review of performance management was and what improvement actions have been identified? And I know this is something we ask you quite routinely, but if you could just fill us in on that. The outcome of the, re the review, uh, the reviews that we did this year are um, the need for us to integrate the time recording systems that we have. We have, s we have systems that are fit for purpose, but they operate on two different packages, which means there's um, a cost to us to um, process the information and bring it together. Um, the time recording system exists in that form for good historic reasons and it's time to move on. So we have, um, sub following the review, we have um, been working to um, develop an implementation plan and we will be reporting that back to the audit committee and to the board um, in the course of the year, looking to um, draw our systems together. There's a whole heap of IT complexity behind this, which I'm very happy to talk about. Um, <laughs> um, if you wish, um, and so on. But basically, this is a, this um, has been a tricky issue for us to resolve um, as we work through how different systems have the, can work together now and what they're future proofing, what the future proofing of, of them is and how we manage data. But we think we've got a, a way forward. We know we've got a way forward and we're working on the implementation of it. And we'll be discussing that with the audit committee who are um, similarly very, um, very interested in, in this area. We'll give you an indication of, of how, how to measure that improvement, this, this process. Um, yeah, so we're, we have loads of data um, what the new approach will give us is, uh, is a, it will make it much easier for individuals to extract the data uh, themselves, for managers to use the data, for everyone to know in real time um, how we're working and so on. And that's more difficult than it should be at the moment. But the systems are fit for purpose. They just require a lot of... The systems are giving us good data, but they require more work than we'd like to put into it. And there's better options available for us now. And we're um, 
looking to get the IT mainly. Yeah, it's, it's it's a mix of all things. It's a it's a part of it's an IT project. Part of it is a culture change project, like all okay. IT projects, mm -hmm. in order to um, simplify time recording codes and so on mm -hmm. uh, behind the scenes. So we've got a good project team working on it. We've had lots of dialogue in the business about it. We've got a clear agreement about what the goal is, and we're working on the implementation plan for that. Okay, thank you. If I could move on a different tack now, on page 34, um, you report that 273 new issues of concern were raised during 2017-18, and 27 of those items uh, arose uh, as prescribed persons under the Public Interest Disclosure Act 1998, sometimes referred to as uh, whistleblowers. Um, this is quite a, an increase on previous years, so I wonder if you could maybe expand a wee bit on that and advise of how new issues of concern are dealt with generally. Um, we take this, um, these contacts from members of the public and sometimes from MSPs and others um, very seriously because they are an important way um, for us to um, keep our feelers out there about what's going on in an individual audited body. Um, if we receive a number of complaints about a particular council or a particular health board, um, it alerts us that there's something the auditor may want to, to be having a closer look at. Um, we, because of that and because of the, the whole range of issues that they can cover, we've concentrated quite a lot over the last couple of years um, in fine-tuning and um, making sure that the uh, approach we're used to handling these contacts from members of the public is properly resourced and that we are very clear about what we can look at and what we can't. Um, some things are not within our area of responsibility, in which case we try to signpost the person who's concerned to somebody who can help them. Um, and if we are able to deal with it, we felt we could do that more quickly and more satisfactorily than we had done in the past. So the um, procedure and the process is on our website. It's very closely monitored by the management team and the audit committee now. But beyond that, it can cover a whole range of issues of concern about audited bodies um, from things like uh, the way in which um, they've made decisions to um, sell or to buy particular local assets to the way decisions have been made about continuing um, public services or reducing them um, all the way through to the way a particular contract was let and people's concerns about that. So they vary a great deal. We have a very detailed annual report on complaints handling um, that gives more information about it, but I think the key feature is the variability. Diane, do you want to add to that? Um, just to say, in terms of operationally how we handle all these inquiries, which can come from a number of sources and so on, we have, as the Auditor General has said, um, the opportunity through our website for people to raise concerns, also through auditors or through correspondence. We have a small uh, a small team who handle all correspondence, document it, review it, share all the um, every Monday all the leadership team in Audit Scotland get an email documenting any changes in the uh, correspondence that we can uh, and how that's been handled, along with the timescales and the responses have, that have been issued and wh whether those have been met or not. Those are discussed um, actively with teams um, in relation to the audited bodies concerned and the use of public money. And there are a whole variety of actions that will follow from that, and we track and manage all of that. Um, it is interesting this year there have been some changes. There have been other years in the past where a particular sector or a particular topic have featured um, more strongly in um, in correspondence or um, areas of concern from members of the public um, and so on. I think this year, although there are some, there's no particular uh, dominant pattern. It is just a volume increase across a number of fronts. In fact, that was actually going to be my next question. Was there a recurring theme in we, the new ones that um, have arisen? But not, not, not anything particularly distinctive from previous years, other than in, in some isolated cases. We do look at uh, the team uh, produce an annual report for the audit committee and the board, and we look systemically at what are the what are the issues that come up, why do they come up, mm -hmm. um, and so on. So, this year primarily, I think it's a vol there are volume increases in some points that, which are not new issues for us to deal with. And has this resulted in additional audit audit work for you? Um, because you know, there has 
been a significant increase? Um, it has on occasion. Um, it has on occasion resulted in additional audit work and sometimes an issue of concern will be raised and we're already actively auditing in an area so it, it folds into work that's already planned. Mm -hmm. so, so nothing terribly surprising other than just um, no issue that stood out this year for you other than a, just a general kind of upsurge of areas? I think some of the issues that were raised with us were already issues that were being audited and reported on in public and peop and some correspondents wished to um, comment or contribute to our, our knowledge base. Okay. Okay. Anyone else want to comment? No, I think if you look at the new issues of concern, the, the trend actually over the last couple of years has been downwards. It does vary a lot year from year. Um, and um, certainly a couple of years ago, we received an awful lot of correspondence about one particular issue in the west of Scotland. Um, so that showed up in the numbers, but didn't require additional audit work. We were already looking at it. On the whole, they tend to be quite small issues in, in the overall scheme of what we do, although they're clearly important to the people who contact us. Um, and the amount of extra work that's needed to resolve them by the audit team isn't um, it doesn't blow the budget for the work they were planning to do anyway. We do our best to accommodate it, and it's only if it was very significant that um, we would need to um, consider whether there was a requirement to ask the body for an additional fee, if it was due to a failure on their part, or indeed to um, reallocate resources within the audit plan to deal with it. But that's unusual. Thank you. Cool. Okay, thank you again. It can be um, just before I ask my specific question, can... And you may not know the answer just now, but you can maybe tell later. If you take all the financial audits that you perform, um, do you have a total of the revenues that you audit and the assets that you audit, just to get a scale of the... Um you an indication of it, but but one of the um, challenges is, as you will know, there'll be lots of um, related party transactions in there. The overall expenditure is something over £40 billion at the moment. Um, the, ass the assets and liabilities, about three years ago, we tried to produce um, a, an estimate of what a balance sheet for Scotland would look like, and I think we came up with a figure of about £120 billion um, of assets and liabilities. Um, but I would need to um, come back to you on what's included and excluded from that because of the... Uh, well, I wouldn't ask you to do a lot of work, but just no, no. to get a feel for the size sure. of the... Um, I, I can refer yeah, you back to the figure we produced like. three or four years ago. Yeah, But the, the, the £40 billion expenditure figure is, is the more robust one. Uh, that's the overall Scottish budget um, that's spent in, in Scotland, the devolved budget. That you would as a firm, actually? Uh, that, that, um, or, or that's audited Scotland on behalf would. of me as Auditor General and the Accounts Commission for local government. Um, as you know, we, we appoint audit, uh, yeah. firms of auditors to do about a third of that. Yeah, yeah thanks. Yeah. Okay, so um, coming back to the, the financial statements, and you have a process for dealing with complaints, which I think is on page 34, where you say that one complaint about recruitment campaign was upheld. Can I ask, not the details of that, but um, to ensure you know, the circumstances that resulted in that upheld complaint have been addressed and, and will not recur? Absolutely. That's one we, we got wrong. Um, in a recruitment campaign, we were informed about a candidate's additional support needs in advance, um, and on the day, um, we failed to take that into account. Uh, they complained uh, to us. Um, we investigated what, have ha what happened and apologised to them, and we've tightened our procedures to make sure it won't happen again. So if somebody complained and weren't happy, what, what can they do? Um, we respond through our complaints process. We have a complaints procedure um, for people who wish to complain about our work and the actions that we've taken. Um, that has the levels within it that you would expect, including, where necessary, review by a member of the board. Um, and if they're not happy, they can complain to the ombudsman, and that has happened on occasion. Um, I think there was one referral to the Ombudsman during 2017-18, um, but the Ombudsman concluded that we'd handled the complaint properly and they weren't minded to investigate further. Can, can I mention another sort of aspect in, in this general area? Um, we've heard during this past year um, a member in the Chamber um, remark that they would not know about something because the auditors had not raised it. I read um, in the newspaper recently about... Um, I think a chief executive at an employment tribunal saying, well, I wouldn't know about that again because the auditors hadn't, hadn't raised it. 
Now, setting aside the rights and wrongs of the, the specific cases, and I'm sure your reports and your engagement contracts all make clear what the responsibilities of the auditors are and the responsibilities of management. Do you feel you need to do more to actually make boards and chief executives or senior people actually aware of what their responsibilities are and what your responsibilities are? Um, I, I, this is an issue we have been reflecting on over the last few months for, for reasons you will understand. Um, in many ways, I think it's difficult to see what more we can do. Um, as you say, in the um, letters of appointment to the firms, um, it's very clear what their responsibilities are. Um, we produce um, a, a statement called uh, Public Audit in Scotland, pr produced by me and the Accounts Commission, which is clear about our responsibilities and those of boards and those charged with governance. That um, runs through the um, Code of Audit Practice, the uh, Annual Audit Plan and the Annual Audit Report. The Annual Audit Report is a very full form document which is, um, first of all, accompanies the um, financial statements to the Audit Committee and the Board itself at the end of each year and is then published on our website um, as well as being available through the Audit Committee papers. Um, and in the case of NHS bodies um, and central government bodies, all of those documents, the uh, financial statements and the, the Annual Audit Report are laid in Parliament. Um, so they are public documents and we try to be clear about what people's responsibilities are. Most of those documents are laid in in Parliament by government itself. So for the NHS, um, they, are, they are sent to uh, the Scottish Health Directorates, Scottish Government Health Directorates for laying. And I assume they have a process for reviewing um, the reports for any significant items and taking action where they need to. We engage with them on a regular basis about our concerns. Um, and as, the, as you and Mr Beattie know, as members of the Public Audit Committee, we have reported on a number of those issues through the formal statutory Section 22 report as well. So I struggle to think what else um, we can do to make sure people charged with governance are taking their responsibilities seriously. Um, but it's obviously a concern if that's not happening routinely. Well, uh, before you know, blaming you becomes a standard response, which mm. is always always the risk. Uh, and, and what you describe is, is fair enough, but it just sounds a little bit in a, in a passive way, as opposed to when you actually meet them to do your planning or to do your closure, just to record with them mm -hmm. face to face. And, and I would give you that assurance that happens routinely. Um, our auditors um, will meet very regularly with the director of finance and his or her team, particularly at the planning stage and during the final accounts period. Um, there is a process of um, reviewing the draft annual audit report because it's a public document to make sure that any comments they have are taken into account, so there should be no surprise in there. And the auditors routinely attend um, audit committees across the public sector and present their um, findings to them. Now, there is a concern in some instances that the audit committee isn't um, either willing or able to fulfil its responsibilities in the way that I think you and I would both expect them to do, um, and the auditors will continue to engage with them and to make the point as clearly as they can about the issues which the audit committee needs to be cited on. Um, the, uh, the, the most persuasive lever we have, I think, is first of all the fact that we do report in public, and secondly the role of the Public Audit Committee as a parliamentary committee, which is um, very um, much uh, focused on following up these issues. Um, but I think, uh, as I say, we've been reflecting on what it means that some of those statements have been made over the last few months. Thank you. Alison? Um, yes, thank you, convener. Um, obviously, pay for senior staff is a, is a matter of, of public interest, and I note on page 54 of the annual report that, that Audit Scotland has reported that the highest paid member of Audit Scotland has paid 3.4 times the median remuneration paid to Audit Scotland staff. Um, and I just wonder if you have any idea how that compares to the wider public sector. We think it's um, not atypical for the wider public sector and it's probably quite low, mm -hmm. um, not for reasons I think that we can take very much credit for, to be frank. Um, there are two reasons for that. One is that my salary isn't set by Audit Scotland, it's set by the Parliament. I'm an office holder of Parliament. Um, and that then sets a context for um, our pay overall. And secondly, that we have fewer low-paid staff than many public bodies do. Um, we know that um, most of our staff are 
professionally qualified accountants. Um, we don't have um, many staff who are um, close to living wage roles. Um, so the ratio tends to be smaller than it would for, for example, a council or a health board um, for those reasons rather than particularly to do with our pay policy. Mm -hmm. Anything you want to add to that, Diane? No, I think that's um, fair. We, it's stayed pretty in a pretty similar area over time. Um, it's not shifted very much. And we are an accredited Scottish living wage employer and we have extended Scottish uh, living wage provisions to contracts that we let for cleaning services and so on, um, built into the contract. So we are conscious of uh, the low pay agenda. It's something we discuss with PCS, our trade union, um, every year and um, actively. And um, those figures are pretty stable over time. And the composition of our workforce is dissimilar to large public sector bodies. Um, so that, that makes it difficult to directly compare, I think. Thank you. Um, a comparison with Audit Scotland's budget proposal for 2017-18 and actual expenditure on page 80 of the annual report and accounts shows that Audit Scotland significantly underspent on a number of budget lines, with the exception of fees and expenses to appoint audit firms, other accommodation costs and staff recruitment. Now, obviously, we welcome any cost savings, uh, but do the, are these underspends recurring? And will they form the basis of future budget proposals? Um, I, I don't think we did have a significant underspend at all this year, Mr Beattie. I think our overall underspend um, was about 0.6 million. Um, of that, 0.2 million was to do with the pension adjustments, which we are required to make at the end of the financial year. Um, and about 0.4 million was due to um, a limited number of underspends on... Um, uh, rather than mislead you, I'll ask Stuart to keep me straight. What was the 0.4 million underspend made up of? Principally, it, it would have been made up of um, training, um, uh, consultancy, um, which we or which we have um, a budget for, and where the management contingency is. So we saved there. Um, looking at on page 80, the actual reduction. Um, there is a big reduction from 2016-17. Um, we did actually have the National Fraud Initiative in 2016-17, which is costs about 190,000, which we didn't have in 2017-18, but we have in the budget for 2018-19. So that's a, a tw uh, every two years we have to have a budget allocation for that. But there is a significant drop in things like uh, training and getting down to nitty-gritty stationery and printing. So um, I think what um, Schedule 4 on page 80 is showing is the actuals for 2018 and 2017, and there are some differences between, between the two years. Um, part of that is to do with our continuing drive to generate efficiencies where we're able to do that without affecting the quality of the work. Um, and as Stuart has said, between uh, 2017 and 2018, we had a, the um, taking out of the 200,000 required for the uh, National Fraud Initiative, which is a biannual exercise, which shows up in legal and other professional fees. Um, but the differences are actual to actual for 2016-17 to 2017-18. OK. Um, I'd like to just whip through one or two items that s stick out for me in the uh, in the report uh, on page which 12 you talk about uh, a new audit quality framework is it possible to get a copy of that I'm not going to interrogate you on it, but uh, yeah. could we see a copy just out of interest for the for the members? Of course. It's been a big area of investment for us this year, so we can happily let you have a copy of the framework and of the um, annual audit quality report that we publish. So. Perfect. And the other thing is you've, uh, you say on page 11 that you've implemented a new approach to auditing best value. Would it be possible to get details of that as well? Certainly. Just, just for interest. Um, bear with me while I try and remember what this was. You're talking about, uh, on page 36, uh, reduced consultancy expenditure 
and training costs. Well, we talked about training costs just now. There is a significant drop there. Consultancy expenditure. What's what's driven that particular drop? How have you been able to accommodate that? Uh, the consultancy expenditure is a budget that we maintain because of the range of topics that our performance audit program particularly can cover. Um, we need to make sure we've got the professional expertise to carry out our work. Sometimes that means um, bringing in uh, specialist support to help us. Um, but we can also bring in that support in other ways um, through, for example, secondments. Um, so we've had a significant number of secondments from other public bodies to help us with that. And you'll see a trade-off between agencies and secondment costs versus consultancy costs, um, which is part of what's happening there. Page 54. And Tell me if I've got this wrong. The CETV at 31st March 2018, does that imply that uh, some of uh, the people mentioned here are reaching their pension cap? Yes, it does. And indeed one's exceeded it? Yes. Are there any implications in terms of uh, employment or... Um, the implications are for the individual's personal tax affairs. Um, as you know, um, over the last few years, the UK government has introduced both um, a lifetime allowance limit and an annual allowance limit. Um, and a number of people employed across the public sector um, who are um, in or reaching their mid-50s are likely to be breaching those caps. The caps were introduced at a high level, I think initially 1.8 million, and have been gradually reduced um, to now about £1 million. Pounds. Um, so people are, are reaching them. But the implications are for the tax liabilities of the individuals um, themselves and need to be met by the individuals. Um, as we've discussed in the Public Audit Committee, there is at least a risk that it affects the um, future career decisions that individuals are taking. Um, but I can only speak for myself and say that um, in my personal circumstances, my role is a privilege and I fully intend to see out the end of my term of office. We're relieved. Thank you, convener. Yeah. Um, turn to page 56. I'm looking at the staff report here and uh, gender balance. Um, overall, the gender balance is slightly in, in favour of uh, the female side, which is fine. But I'm looking at uh, management. There seems a huge disparity there. Um, and the disparity is that of a management team of four, three of us are women and one is a man. Um, that puts it in perspective that it's a small team. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. On page 59, early retirement and severance. So you have an ongoing voluntary early release arrangement? We don't have an ongoing voluntary um, release arrangement. We have a policy for voluntary severance, and each year um, the uh, board considers whether there is a business case for um, making a voluntary severance uh, scheme available within the terms of that policy. Um, as we say here, last year, five members of staff left under that policy, but it's not a standing scheme which is available um, unless the board agrees that there's a business case for it. So is it a case that periodically the board goes out to the staff and says for a limited period there's a voluntary... Well, we expect that the Auditor General and the Chief Operating Officer to advise us whether there's a particular issue. For example, um, when you merge the two offices... Uh, into the one, the new office location, there obviously arises some duplication of front office staff and other things. And you would look at that, and if we see a case for it, we will approve for that year a scheme. But we have to be satisfied before we give the green light to it every year. And if there is no case, there won't be one. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, this is something the Auditor General herself, of course, has been looking at in other public bodies, is the, the business case... Uh, for early, early mm -hmm. or voluntary uh, release, and the total cost was 156,000 in this case. Yes, the um, total cost for five departures was 156,000 um, pounds. The scheme that we have, the policy, um, is that um, as well as the savings um, from the uh, 
the post that's being released, we have to generate savings of 25% um, that continue into the future for there to be a business case for that individual to go. Um, so it, there is both a scheme overall which applies, a business case for invoking it in a particular year, and then the individual applications are judged against that criterion to make sure that it is good value for money for the public purse and that the governance stands up. Diane, do you want to add to that? We produce a, a governance report to the remuneration committee every year to track the uh, delivery of the savings of previous departures under the early release scheme, and that's an annual feature of the um, remuneration committee's uh, governance of staffing matters in the business. Turn to page 70, just a couple of quickies. Can you remind me what the, inter the intangible assets are? I know I ask you this every year. You, you ask every year at Convener, and every year I tell you that it's software licences which we're required to capture in that work. Of course it is. Yeah. Um, just moving down to the current assets, you've got prepayments within that of 508,000. What, what is that? Stuart. Can you point us to the reference chair? It's uh, on the... Page, page 70. Page 70. Okay. Current assets, and it's uh, note 9. Because obviously there's been quite a significant in increase in current assets there. Uh, or at least receivables. I think it's yeah, going it's to... Just... Oh, Sorry, no, it's okay. <laughs> I think it's going to be to do with the way in which we um, bill audited bo bodies for their audit fees and pay the firms for the work they've carried out. So there's a work in progress calculation which is always trying to match the amount of work which we've billed and for which we've paid with the um, point in, in the financial year at which the accounts are prepared. So within that there's so a mix timing. of... Exactly. Mm -hmm. There's a mix okay. of prepayments and also um, accruals effectively. And just coming down to current liabilities... The next uh, item on that page, deferred income, five hundred eighty-five thousand. That will that would that would be the Could same. Be. That's where we've invoiced. It's the other side. Yes, yeah, in advance. Okay. The last question I want to ask was about internal audit. Obviously, uh, Audit Scotland's got internal auditors. Yeah. Are they in-house? Are they bought in? We have just um, appointed for a, a three-year term. Um, BDO, and I think Diane can tell you more about that. Um, we, the chair of the audit committee, um, Heather Logan, is um, <coughs> leads on this matter in, uh, with the audit committee and supporting the board. We put out to tender through the procurement um, uh, register this year um, for internal audit services and um, BDO were appointed for three years. They made a submission uh, to us. We um, are maintaining our level of investment in internal audit at about the same level as previous years. There's a full programme of work. Um, there's a, a three-year programme broken down into each year. That's fully discussed with the audit committee. Um, the terms of reference for each individual piece of work are also um, discussed with the audit committee and the reporting of the work is to the audit committee and also shared as all the audit committee papers are with the external auditors. I think it's about 27, 29,000. 27,000 a year. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Do any members have any other questions they would like to ask? Can I ask a yeah, of course. I maybe missed it in the, the papers, but coming back to the ICAST reports, can you say a little bit more about what they do? Yes, it, in a sense it comes back to the convener's um, short question about the quality framework yeah. mm -hmm. and the annual audit quality reports. Um, we recognised, um, first of all, that there are increasing risks in audited bodies given the financial pressures they're under and that our recent appointment round had, had generated price and cost savings again in the firms that we use um, and the benchmarking we do with our own teams. At that point, um, we had uh, recruited, we had appointed ICAS um, for a period of six years to carry out reviews of the financial statements audits that were carried out by our in-house teams, which had been very helpful for us in providing assurance, but also identifying some areas where we could improve our audit approach. Um, but I was very conscious that that only gave us a partial view across the work which is carried out on behalf of me and the Commission. 
Um, there was no direct re external review of the work carried, the financial statements audit carried out by the firms that we appoint. The FRC regulates them, and the ICA, EW, and ICAS regulate them, as you know, in different ways. But very, very unlikely that they would look at any of the audits they carry out on our behalf. And the review of the performance audit and best value audit work was done by means of peer review with the other audit agencies. Um, so as part of the new audit quality framework, we've put in place um, a very clear understanding of the role of um, hot reviews and cold reviews under the International Standard on Quality Control. Um, but also put in place an ICAS contract which covers all of the audit work and will, will cover all of the audit providers over the five-year term of the appointments. The annual audit quality report pulls all of that together with other sources of assurance around elements of the IAASB quality framework, um, primarily to provide me, the Commission and the Board with assurance about the quality of audit work, but also as part of accountability to this Commission more widely. So who selects the files they review? They do. They select so it's absolutely them. clear absolutely. it's not you deciding no. No. we won't do this one this year? No, it's, it's their decision. That was very much part of the, the um, approach that we put out to tender. They won the tender, but whoever won would have full um, freedom to choose whichever audits they thought appropriate. Chair, uh, it's a matter which the Board and, and myself in particular have taken an interest in this whole question of quality. Given the very competitive nature <coughs> of the uh, quotes we received, the question we all asked was, is this the detriment of the quality we're going to get? And so this is why we spent so much time on this. And <coughs> some of the information we've got uh, we've given there is in the Audit Quality Annual Report, which you've asked for and sets out. We're very conscious, against the background of other matters elsewhere in the, in the commercial world, about the need to be on top of the issue of quality and to ensure an independent element of it. You can be assured that your board is very much alert on this issue. But it focuses on internal work as well, not just the, the contracted out work. It covers all, all of the audit work. All of the audit work. 65% of it is in-house, so that's very important, obviously. We've done that for longer. We had done that since about 2010, I think. Yeah. Um, but it, the, the, the shift now that it's done on a common basis across all of the audit work. And the details are in that your yes. audit quality yes. report? Yeah. Yes. OK, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, Alison. Um, you've previously published information um, regarding EU withdrawal, and you've mentioned a couple of times this morning potential implications. Um, and in one of your reports, you've said all public bodies are likely to face capacity issues to some extent as they try to manage the implications of EU withdrawal and maintain business as usual. Um, does that apply to yourselves? It, it, it does. Um, we, we have had to think hard about what EU withdrawal means for our work, for the bodies that we audit, and for ourselves. Um, we've built on the approach that we've taken to the new financial powers in developing a small team of people whose job it is themselves to do the thinking and the research and the understanding, but then to work with colleagues across um, all of the audits to help them think about what it means for their um, particular audits. Um, we're in, I think, a good place with this year's audit planning guidance that we have been clear with auditors that the likely effects are going to be on um, funding, on the workforce and on regulation, and it will apply differently in different audited bodies, but as part of the planning process we were discussing earlier, mm -hmm. the auditors should be thinking about that and discussing it with the, the bodies that they audit. Mm -hmm. um, internally, we are thinking about what it means for the seven or so staff we have ourselves who are from other EU countries um, and who um, will have concerns about um, their future um, ability to live and work in Scotland, making sure we support them, and then doing the best we can with the levels of uncertainty we're all facing to think about what that may mean in terms of additional audit work for the Scottish Government um, or for particular bodies that are particularly affected by it. Um, but at the moment, uh, lacking a crystal ball, we're having to just make sure that our plans are resilient and can respond to different scenarios depending on what happens over the next nine months or so. Okay, thank you. Clearly a challenge. No other questions? Can I ask if the uh, General or Chair of the Board have anything to add before we wind up? Just my thanks, Chair. In that case, thank you very much for attending. And uh, we, we'll move to private... No, no, we don't. Yeah. No, we're going to have a changeover of witnesses. Thank you.
move on, I'd like to welcome to the meeting Stephen Cunningham, partner, and Gillian So, audit manager from Alexander Sloan. And uh, do you have any comments you'd like to make before we open questions? Okay. Good morning, uh, convener, uh, and apologies for our late arrival. Um, I'd just like to start by uh, confirming that we've received all information and explanations which allow us to undertake our audit for the year ended 31st March 2018. I can also confirm that there was not any limitations on the scope of our audit work. Just to give you a brief overview of our work, uh, the firm of Alexander Sloan has been appointed to carry out the external audit of the 2018 financial statements of Audit Scotland. During the year, we attended all audit committee meetings of Audit Scotland. We attended the offices to carry out the interim audit work in February, and the final audit work was carried out in May this year. Our work was carried out in accordance with international standards and auditing. As part of our work, we've reviewed all internal audit reports during the year and held discussions with the internal auditor. As I mentioned earlier, we received all information and explanations that we required to carry out our work and our audit was carried out without any problems. In accordance with our tender and quality control procedures, the audit file and accounts have also been subject to a second partner audit review. And based on our audit work, we form an opinion on whether the accounts give a true and fair view, whether they've been prepared in accordance with international financial reporting standards as interpreted and adapted by the Financial Reporting Manual, and to confirm that they've been properly prepared in accordance with the Public Finance and Accountability Scotland Act 2000 and directions by Scottish Ministers. Being satisfied with audit evidence, we signed our audit report on the 12th of June 2018. Our audit report is unmodified, that is, we're satisfied the accounts do give a true and fair view and in accordance with the legislation and the accounting rules, and there are no significant matters that we wish to bring to the attention of the Commission or any other read of the accounts. Thank you for that. That uh, answers my first question. Um, can I ask how Alexander Sloan assures itself that the internal audit process that's being undertaken is robust and in accordance with the appropriate standards? Um, as I mentioned, we attend all of the audit committee meetings with the internal auditor. Um, we also in attendance prior to that meeting to a private closed session with the internal auditors there as well. We also hold discussions as well as reviewing all of their papers um, which are presented to the committee. So based on that, from our point of view, we are satisfied in terms of the internal audit work carried out and its any implications for the external audit. Do you review the internal audit programme? Uh, we, see, we get to see the internal audit programme and we'd get the opportunity to make any comments if we felt there was any areas that we felt should be in that programme which so are missing. So you're satisfied it's a robust process? Yes, Do you receive internal audit reports? Yes, we receive all of the reports that uh, go in the year and we review these of, to make sure that if there are any audit implications. And there, are, there, are, there is nothing of concern that you're aware of? No, um, nothing that concern in term, that would cause any concern for the audit of the financial statements. Rona? Thank you. Yeah, good morning. Um, in your, really, this is just to clarify because you've pretty much covered it in your, your okay. opening um, statement. In your report to those charged with governance um, and in your report to the Audit Commission of Audit Scotland, did you raise any matters that the Commission should be aware of? No, there was no matters that we uh, believe the Commission should be aware of in the course of was our it, audit. Was there anything in your kind of own sort of, you know, <coughs> notes at the side that you, 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 you wanted to keep a kind of record of for maybe if anything was repeated? Um, no, I mean, well, once we carry out the audit work, we have a, a clothing meeting uh, which was attended by the Chief Operating Officer, the Director of Audit, uh, and we would just clarify any matters from that. But there was no matters of any significance which we needed to bring either to the Board of Audit uh, Scotland or to yourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Bill? Oh, sorry. Was, uh, um, of course, it, we, we take um, you know, great reliance uh, on what you say. There are some particularly highly technical accounting requirements around 
pension costs and the calculations of liabilities. Can you confirm that you're satisfied with all the disclosures in these accounts? Yes, uh, we spend a lot of time in the audit looking over these, uh, considering the assumptions as well and making sure that they're reasonable before they go into the final accounts. Uh, I maybe missed it. Do you disclose the materiality level that you, that you uh, use? We don't as a practice, no. You don't? No. Can you tell us? I don't have that figure off the top of my head. Um, I can get a note if you wish. Does it, um, I will not say concern you, but I don't, were you here earlier to, to know that um, Audit Scotland audits something like £120 billion pounds of, yes. of assets? Is that, um, you're quite comfortable in, in auditing the auditor of that huge number? Yes, we are. Uh, we believe we've got all the procedure in place to carry out an efficient audit. Well, I'm not just an efficient audit. Uh, sorry, an, an efficient and effective, effective audit. Effective audit, yes. yes. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, audit Scotland's included 1.6 million of income in its accounts, which relates to work completed but not yet charged to audit bodies. Are you satisfied that the calculation of that is robust? I can tell you a prime focus on the audit is the work in progress calculation. We spend a lot of time reviewing the calculation and uh, we'll look at that from the agreed fees, looking at the proportion of work carried out, uh, how that calculation's done um, to make sure, and yes, at the end of the day, we are happy with that calculation. Okay. Um, do members have any other questions? Other than the, the usual question, is there anything else we should know? <laughs> <laughs> no, nothing further. <laughs> Is there any other comments you'd like to make before I wind up this um, section? No, no other comments. Thank you. In that case, thank you very much for your attendance, and we'll move this meeting into private session. Okay, thank you.